So Yannick, uh, welcome to the National Critics' Choice, and uh, here we are, you know, uh, the Singapore Dance Theatre is now reviving its new season for 2012. Uh, tell us more about uh, what's new and what's coming up, and uh, how can the people here around the world, including Singapore, give support to your cause? Well, the thing is, is that almost in every major city throughout the world that is a cultural hub has a dance company like Singapore Dance Theatre, that's one of its flagship companies. Usually there are museums, there's symphony orchestras, there's theatre companies, and dance companies. And they don't necessarily mean that they're ballet companies, but that's why Singapore Dance Theatre is not called Singapore Ballet, because we represent both contemporary and classical worlds. And I think it's more and more the norm with dance companies to uh, show a wide variety of works. And this year with Singapore Dance Theatre, it's interesting, we tend to have years that we have a lot of new ballets, and then a year that we sort of hold off and, and use our normal repertory, and then a year that we have, and this happens to be a year in which we're doing a great deal of new work. Um, but we're showcasing, at the beginning and the end, two works that are very established in our repertory. Um, Swan Lake at the beginning, which we've done twice before, uh, and both times they were very successful. People ask what's new about Swan Lake, and the thing is, is that it's tradition. There's what's new about it is the fact that you keep to the tradition. You establish something that's done at a very high level theatrically, artistically, and as a classical dance company, and then you fine hone it, you give it more depth, you give it more character, you give it more style. So we have Swan Lake at the beginning of the year, and then we have Sleeping Beauty at the end of the year, and those are sort of like the bookends. And in between the bookends, we have five new works that will be done. Um, some are company premieres, like uh, Edward D. Young's Age of Innocence uh, and George Balanchine's Development Number 15. And then we have several choreographers, Toro Shimizaki, Val Canaparoli, that are making new works for us, that are made specifically for Singapore Dance Theatre that have never been done before. And, and in, bet in between that, we have our own repertory that we, we bring back, because not everything can be new. Not everything should be uh, old. So we have a mix. And in the middle of that, we do, actually right in the middle of that, we do a children's work that's made for the wee ones, tiny ones, my favorite. Uh, and it's called Peter and Blue Go Around the World. And it's about a little boy Peter and his dog Blue and their cat Calico that take a magical journey all the way around the world. And the idea is that they go to lots of different countries but in the end, home is best when they come home to their parents. I like that. Very well said. Tell us more about you know, the soul of ballet, or dance, as you call it. You know, what is the soul of, of ballet dancing all about, uh, in your own description? It is about soul. <laughs> it's about, um, if you think about it as a language, movement is a language, and it's about the expression of how we feel as people expressed through movement, and that movement is a language, and we combine it in various different forms. We combine it both in classical dance, we combine it in contemporary work, and it, it depends if it's intimate solo work or if it's very large group work, where you have, like in Swamp Lake, we have enormous groups of, of the women, and I, I'm not very fond of the word corps de ballet. I really don't like that word. It, it's not, there's nothing wrong with it as a word, it just means that it's the body of the word. Um, but uh, a lot of people uh, are fixated on the principles of a work. And one assumes that if you have a dance company, that your principles and your followers will be of a very, very high quality. Um, but when you see the dancers that form the bulk of the work, when they're good, you know you have an excellent company. And uh, it's the soul of the company is really held in Singapore Dance Theatre in the fact that we have an equal balance between our group and our principles. And that there is no, it's not a company that revolves around one specific individual or a very small group of individuals. It's really about a very strong group of dancers overall. And speaking about the soul of dance, you know, you as a director of the Singapore Dance Theatre here in Singapore, um, how exciting your life has been. I mean, do you, uh, you have a, a, a amazing history yourself <laughs> uh, becoming you know, who you are today. Uh, what's, what's the secret of, of your distinguished career? 
So I had little, uh, I had little hope in my career. My my grandfather was a symphony musician. My mother was a dancer, and you know the path was sort of right there in front of me, and I was just smart enough to take it. It was um, I was very lucky, but I I for myself I had a very clear moment where I thought. I will never be happy unless I'm a dancer, never. And it was when I was about 14, which is very crucial when you have to make that decision whether you want to become a professional or whether you want it to be an amateur pursuit. And uh, at that moment, you don't think about uh, how much you're going to be paid or what your life is going to be like or if it's difficult. The only thing you want is the ability to express yourself as a dancer. And when I realized that, that was my desire, I didn't even think about anything but getting there. And so I was lucky, um, and I was fortunate that I had enough gifts and I had enough support from my family that I could pursue it as a profession. No one, uh, everyone was very pleased that, that that's what I wanted because it was very clear in my thought process that it was my hope. And so going through that process of training as a dancer and getting your first job and finding your way through to become a, go from your very first year to get solo roles to go on to do principal roles. And then I sort of halfway through, people started figuring out that I was smart. Um, I sort of knew everybody else's roles around me and I had a sense of someone other than myself. So I started teaching and I started rehearsing and then I worked with a very important Singaporean choreographer, Go Chusan, as his assistant. And that took me all around the world staging his ballads. And then from there, I, when Singapore Dance Theatre was established in 1988, the first thing that went on stage was one of Chusan's ballets that I taught the company and I would come back on an annual basis until uh, it became inevitable that when they um, wanted to move forward with the company in a certain way, they asked me if I would help to do it and asked me if I'd be the director. So that's how I did it. So Yannick, you know, speaking about the legacy of the Singapore Dance Theatre itself right now today, well, how do you see for the next five years uh, the plans for the Singapore Dance Theatre uh, taking its leap? Uh, and how do one, especially local Singaporeans and as well as uh, out those who are outside of Singapore, how can they be part of this great uh, organization? It's interesting that you ask that because I just did a, a, a conference on education and dance and that topic came up very, very strongly. And uh, the example that I used is the fact that it's considered in great talent comes out of unusual places. And it doesn't matter if it's producing a great soccer player or a great ballet dancer or a remarkable violinist or a, a, an astonishing singer. It's because it's considered to be a noble profession. That being in the profession is very much more. Okay.